All right, let me see. Can you hear me now? <laughs> uh, welcome and I greet you all in the name of the crucified and risen Lord. So glad to see each and every one of you on uh, this day of the equinox, actually. Um, so enjoy the, the, sun, the sunshine as the days get longer. Just a few brief announcements before we begin. <laughs> the first of which is I want to say a very big thank you to everyone who helped out with this past week's food bank and clothing ministry. Um, as always, um, we are humbled to open our doors to the community and to be with our neighbors in need. Um, so thanks to everyone who contributed um, or helped out with that. This coming Wednesday, we do continue our midweek Lenten series. Um, we will be at St. John's Barners, um, just up the hill. At Wednesday, I'm sorry, on Wednesday at 7 p.m. And uh, just as a reminder, there is no soup and bread meal beforehand, uh, but we do have the worship service at 7, so you're more than welcome to join us there. Uh, for this coming week, I will have a little switch for my normal schedule. I will, I will be in the office tomorrow, and uh, I will be away on Friday in case you are looking for me in this coming week. And um, lastly, I just wanted to give everyone a short um, update um, about our dear brother in Christ, Charles Ebling, uh, who I saw um, on Friday. Um, he's been in the hospital for almost two months now. Um, it's been kind of an extended you know, stay for him and a little bit uh, tough, of course, for the whole family. But Charles did receive some good news, which was that his last biopsy came back cancer-free. However, he emphasized in our conversation twice, he emphasized that Cancer-free does not mean cured. And so he will continue receiving chemotherapy uh, for the foreseeable future. So he's not 100% done, 
Um, in fact, it is still a long road for, for him to, to go, uh, but we did receive good news. So glory to God uh, for that good news, and please continue to keep Charles and the whole Ebling family in your prayers. Those are all the announcements I have. There's a few others I invite you to, to read at your convenience. Are there any prayer requests for the prayers of intercession? Yeah. Or any other announcements? Mm-hmm. Okay, for healing? Of of Dave. Or okay. Okay, right now, so. Okay. So Okay, thank you, Sandy. Yes. Okay. Okay. I have her in here for today. So if you couldn't hear, that was uh, Marsha Williams. The reason she's on the prayer list was a recent diagnosis of colon cancer. So we certainly keep her in our prayers as well. Any others? Mm-hmm. Rob? Mm-hmm. So, what is it? Uh, about two months from now, we'll be having a good old cheap shuffle in the spring cleaning. Um, I put flyers out on the table with could be flyers and sign up sheets if you want to run. Uh, I'm sure you're going to do I'm planning on it. Oh. And my rival, Justin Lidacker. <laughs> I want revenge this time, so it's motivating me. If, uh, if you know anywhere that you want to put up a fire, that would be a good place. Okay. Uh, so All right. So, okay, very good. Got to start somewhere. So, any others? Thank you, Robert. Okay, you can always pray later on as the Spirit moves us. But seeing no others, I will invite you, if you are able, to please rise for the confession and forgiveness that is found in the bulletin. In the name of God, who makes a way in the wilderness walks with us and guides us in our pilgrimage. Amen. Let us keep a time of silence for self-reflection. Holy One, We confess that we have wandered far from you. We have not trusted your promises. We have ignored your prophets in our own day. We have squandered our inheritance of grace. We have failed to recognize you in our midst. Have mercy on us. Forgive us and turn us again to you. Teach us to follow in your ways. Assure us again of your love and help us to love our neighbor. Amen. Beloved in Christ, the word draws near to you, and all who call out to God shall be saved. In Jesus, God comes to you again and again and gathers you under wings of love. In Jesus' name, your sins are forgiven. God journeys with you and teaches you how to live in love. Amen. Our first hymn comes from the green hymnal, hymn 358, Glories of Your Name Are Spoken.
The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Let us pray. Eternal God, your kingdom has broken into our troubled world through the life, death, and resurrection of your Son. Help us to hear your word and obey it, and bring your saving love to fruition in our lives. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Assembly may be seated.
like that song. Good morning. The first reading comes from the book of Isaiah, chapter 55, verses 1 through 9. Ho, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. And you that have no money, come, buy, and eat. Come, buy wine and milk, without money and without price. Why do you spend your money for that which is not bread, and your labor for that which does not satisfy? Listen carefully to me, and eat what is good, and delight yourselves in rich food. Incline your ear and come to me. Listen so that you may live. I will make with you an everlasting covenant, my steadfast, sure love for David. See, I made him a witness to the peoples, a leader and commander for the peoples. See, you shall call nations that you do not know, and nations that do not know you shall run to you because of the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, for he has glorified you. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake their way and the unrighteous their thoughts. Let them return to the Lord that he may have mercy on them, and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. The psalm is taken from chapter 63 and will be read responsively by verse. O oh God, you are my God. Eagerly I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh faints for you, as in a dry and weary land where there is no water. For your steadfast love is better than life itself. My lips shall give you praise. My spirit is content as with the richest of foods, and my mouth praises you with joyful lips. For you have been my helper, and under the shadow of your wings, I will rejoice. The second reading comes from 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and begins with verse 1. I do not want you to be unaware, brothers and sisters, that our ancestors were all under the cloud and all passed through the sea, and all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea, and all ate the same spiritual food and all drank the same spiritual drink. For they drank from the spiritual rock that followed them, and the rock was Christ. Nevertheless, God was not pleased with most of them, and they were struck down in the wilderness. Now these things occurred as examples for us, so that we might not desire evil as they did. Do not become idlers as some of them did. As it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink, and they rose up to play. We must not indulge in sexual immorality as some of them did. And 23,000 fell 
in a single day. We must not put Christ to the test, as some of them did, and were destroyed by serpents. And do not complain, as some of them did, and were destroyed by the destroyer. These things happened to them to serve as an example, and they were written down to instruct us on whom the ends of the ages have come. So, if you think you are standing, watch out that you do not fall. No testing has overtaken you that is not common to everyone. God is faithful, and he will not let you be tested beyond your strength. But with the testing, he will also provide the way out so that you may be able to endure it. This ends the reading. If you are able, please rise for the reading of the gospel. The Holy Gospel according to St. Luke, the 13th chapter. At that very time, there were some present who told him about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. Jesus asked them, Do you think that because these Galileans suffered in this way, they were worse sinners than all the other Galileans? No, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all perish as they did. Were those 18 who were killed when the Tower of Siloam fell on them, do you think that they were worse offenders than all the others living in Jerusalem? No, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all perish just as they did. Then he told this parable. A man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he came looking for fruit on it and found none. So he said to the gardener, See here. For three years I have come looking for fruit on this fig tree, and still I find none. Cut it down. Why should it be wasting the soil? He replied, Sir, let it alone for one more year, until I dig around it and put manure on it. If it bears fruit next year, well and good. But if not, you can cut it down. The Gospel of the Lord. Congregation may be seated. I'd like to invite the children down for a moment. (laughs) Carly was so excited to come down before. She just couldn't wait. How are you all today? Good. How are you, Carly? Not sure? I, um, did you all know that I'm, I don't want to brag, but I'm a pretty good gardener. Do you know that? No? <laughs> you look skeptical. I want to show you some of the things I, I grew recently. <laughs> Here you go. Just hold that for me. All right. I grew that banana. All right, Brady, ready? One, two, ready? One, two. Oh, oh. <laughs> you know what that one is? Grapefruit, I grew that. No, you didn't. Look, wait a minute. I put the. No, you didn't. Wait a minute. I also put the stickers on later. And there's a sticker on it. What are you, a grocery store worker? You're right. You're right, I'm just kidding. I didn't actually grow those. Grocery store, a grocery farmer, or are you a grocery store worker? Nope, I'm neither. Yes. I was just kidding. I didn't grow any of those, but you're right. They don't grow bananas in Pennsylvania. They don't grow grapefruits around here. They do grow apples around here. And this is what I wanted to ask you. Um, Do you know how long it takes for an apple tree to start growing apples? Any idea? A long time? (laughs) It's a pretty good guess. So according to what I was reading just the other day, for a normal apple tree, it takes about eight years before it starts actually producing apples. So that means, you know, if you planted a tree back in 2014, 
that means it would just now be starting to, to grow apples. So imagine, I mean, that's, that takes a lot of patience, right? So, um, so what would you do, what would you do if, I'll take this back, what would you do if you planted an apple tree eight years ago and you came back and there were still no apples on it? Angry? <laughs> You'd probably go to the store and buy some, right? What if, what if you came back after 10, after 10 years and there were no apples on it? You would kick the tree? <laughs> you get, yeah, well, in the story today, that's what the man wanted to do. He came back to his fig tree. There were no figs on it. And he wanted to cut it down. But then what did the gardener say? Not sure? The gardener said, let's just wait one more year. Let me work on the tree, and maybe it will start growing some figs. So I think the point of this story, my friends, is that, is that God is very patient. And God is eager to give us another chance. Even if we haven't done anything good lately, God doesn't give up on us um, and doesn't, doesn't take out the chainsaw to, to cut us down. But instead, God wants to give us the fertilizer to help us grow and to, to bear fruit. So let's say, let's say a quick prayer together. So dear God, I thank you for these wonderful children, um, for their faithfulness and for the ways that they serve you in their daily lives. We thank you, Lord, for the example of the fig tree. Um, that Jesus taught us about. And we pray, Lord, that you will help us to bear fruit always um, and that you will guide us and lead us all the days of our lives. Teach us to have the same patience that you have. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, all right. You can go have a seat. Thanks. <clears throat> May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Growing up, one of my favorite shows to watch was The Simpsons. Hard to believe it's still running after 34 years, <laughs> but new episodes continue to air. Way back in 1991, when George H.W. Bush was president, there was an episode of The Simpsons that made a big impression on me. It begins when the family goes to a Japanese restaurant for dinner and Homer orders sushi made from fugu, which is a type of puffer fish. And this is true. This is actually, they didn't make this up for the show, but the puffer fish must be prepared in a very specific way because certain parts of it are poisonous. And in the episode, the master chef of the restaurant was preoccupied, so it comes to this chef trainee to prepare this very special sushi. And after Homer eats it, um, he, he ends up not feeling well, and he goes to the hospital, and the doctor tells him he has only 22 hours to live. So Homer decides to make the best use of his last day on Earth. He writes a list of all the things he wants to do, so he has a good heart-to-heart talk with his son Bart. Um, he listens to Lisa play her saxophone. Um, he makes a video of himself for the baby Maggie so she will have something to remember him by. Um, then he reconciles with his father. Um, he's, in, he's sure to tell his boss, Mr. Burns. He tells him off. He tells him exactly what he thinks to his face, you know. Maybe not the best idea. <laughs> he then stops by the bar to have one last drink with his, with his friends. And finally he heads home to spend his remaining hours with his dear wife. But he wakes up at midnight, um, he gets out of bed, and he says goodbye to each of his family members as they sleep. And he goes downstairs and listens to the Bible on tape, uh, watching as the sun comes up. And so when the family wakes up in the morning, they all think that Homer has died, but they are much relieved to find that miraculously, he has survived the poison pufferfish and is very much alive. So of course, Homer is overjoyed that he has been given a second chance at life, 
And he leaps in the, in the air, he has tears in his eyes, and he vows to make the most of each day living life to the fullest. The episode ends, however, with Homer back to his old ways, sitting on the couch, watching a bowling tournament while eating a bag of pork rinds. <laughs> but the episode raises some good questions. What would you do if you only had one day left to live? What if it was a month or six months or a year? Probably you would want to make the best use of that time. You'd want to spend time with your family and friends. You might seek forgiveness from someone you hurt. Uh, You might forgive someone that had wronged you. You might travel to a place you always wanted to visit but never had the chance. Um, We're all familiar with the expression bucket list. Um, It has entered the English language following the film of the same name starring Morgan Freeman and Jack Nicholson. It's about two terminally ill men who travel around the world uh, doing all the things they never had the chance to do before they kick the bucket. And while the film receives sort of mixed reviews, the idea of having a wish list of goals to accomplish in one's lifetime seems to have real staying power. Many great philosophers have thought and written about time. The Roman philosopher Seneca once said, we fail to treat time as a valuable resource even though it is arguably our most precious and least renewable one. He said, imagine walking down the street and seeing a rich man throwing away his money, just tossing money up into the air. You would think to yourself, that man is insane. Why is he doing that? And yet, we see others and ourselves throwing away something more valuable every day, our time. The amount of time we get is uncertain, but it is surely limited. If you lose all your money, you can always make more. You can always borrow it from someone else. But you can't make more time. You can't borrow time from someone else. In this morning's gospel story, Jesus talks about two groups of people who tragically had their lives cut short. The first group were victims of political violence. For some reason, the Bible does not say why, they were killed by a cruel, ruthless dictator. As for the second group, their time was cut short due to a freak accident. A tower collapsed on them. Did an earthquake cause it to fall, or was it shoddy workmanship? We just don't know. Jesus asked the crowd, do you think those people were worse sinners than anyone else? No, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all perish just as they did. This story is difficult to hear because it goes against our sense of fairness. In the ancient world, as in the present day, People tend to think that when bad things happen to someone, it is a result of some kind of wrongdoing, right? That people just got what they deserved. And conversely, we like to think that when good things happen to us, it's because of our hard work, virtue, and wise decision-making. Good or bad, we often see things from a cause and effect point of view. And there is some truth to this cause and effect way of thinking. For example, both of my grandfathers started smoking when they were very young. One quit in his 40s and lived to be over 90 with no significant health problems. The other kept smoking into his late 70s, developed severe emphysema, and needed an oxygen tank the last several years of his life. So certainly there is some truth to the cause and effect notion. But at the same time, there are people who never smoke, who never have a drop of alcohol, and they still develop lung cancer or liver disease. Pastor Brian Stoffergen points out that in this story, Jesus does not deny that those who were killed by Pilate or the tower were innocent victims. What Jesus discounts is first, the idea that God caused their deaths because they were sinners, and second, the fact that they died in such tragedies indicates they were worse sinners than anyone else. Jesus says those those ideas are not true. And then Jesus goes on to say that repentance is for everyone. We all need to repent. 
And while it's true that some people are worse sinners than others, for example, the white-collar crook who steals millions of dollars through fraud is worse than the teenager who shops us a pair of shoes, but nevertheless, they both need to repent. They both need to change their ways. God will judge all of us, and we will all answer to God for what we have done and for the things that we have failed to do. But throughout the Gospels, Jesus has a way of giving people what they need. Often it was healing for those who suffered physically or mentally. He was eager to remove the social stigma for those on the outskirts of society. And of course, he made feeding the hungry a big priority. Many of the people Jesus encountered didn't need food or healing. Many of them were not outcasts. These were the well-to-do people, such as the scribes and Pharisees, the ones who attended worship every week, the holier-than-thou type of folks who looked down their noses on the sinners and 'er ne'er-do-wells. And what these people needed from Jesus was a reality check, a wake-up call. Throughout the Gospel of Luke, the people Jesus criticizes the most harshly are the unrepentant, the people who think they're doing pretty well on their own, who don't really need God's mercy or forgiveness. Jesus doesn't condemn people who miss worship services. He doesn't condemn people who work on the Sabbath. But woe to you who fail to repent, he says. The people of Nineveh will rise up at the judgment with this generation and condemn it because they repented at the proclamation of Jonah. And see, something greater than Jonah is here. And then Jesus tells this interesting little parable, just four verses long, about a man who planted a fig tree. But upon finding it with no fruit, he wants to cut it down and get rid of it. The gardener pleads with him, Sir, just give it a little more time. What's the harm of waiting one more year? Let me work on it. Add some fertilizer, give it some tender, loving care, and then, if there is still no fruit, then you might want to consider cutting it down. Usually, when we think of repentance, it's sort of like a New Year's resolution. We wake up on January 1st and say, this year I'm going to the gym every day, I'm going to declutter the basement, I'm going to learn a new language, Uh, no more drinking beer. Uh, But then by the time St. Patrick's Day rolls around, we've had three or four Guinnesses, and we haven't gotten very far with those resolutions. So we normally think about repentance as changes we make to improve ourselves. But in this morning's gospel text, the purpose of repentance is not to improve oneself. The purpose of repentance is to bear fruit. Now, as you can tell from my children's sermon, I'm I'm actually not a gardener or farmer by any means. But I'm pretty sure that fig trees and apple trees and even coconut trees, for that matter, don't produce fruit for their own consumption. Isn't that the case, right? Fig trees don't eat figs. The fruit they bear is for the nourishment and enjoyment and well-being of others. Apple trees don't eat apples. The apples they produce are eaten by deer, mice, bears, turkeys, songbirds, and people. For this reason, repentance can also be thought of as a turning away from self-centered ways of living to leading a life of lifting up, building up, and nurturing those around us. And besides, how does a tree repent? Jesus is telling this parable about repentance, and the example he uses is a fig tree. Can a fig tree get up, walk to a better spot, go to the gym every day, work harder to grow figs? No, right? A fig tree can't prune itself. It can't get its own fertilizer. But it can be changed, transformed, by the patient and persistent work of the gardener. The gardener sees something in the fig tree that others don't see. The landowner thinks the fig tree is just wasting space, but the gardener sees something else, something of value. 
No, sir, this fig tree is worth saving. It might not have any fruit on it today, but give me a little time and I can bring this barren tree to life and it will bear fruit like you couldn't believe. God has blessed us, each and every one of us, in many ways. But today, I invite you to give thanks for the gift of time, the most precious resource we can have. If you're here today, it's a blessing. God has given you one more day for Jesus, the loving vine dresser and gardener, to make you into the fruit-bearing tree that God intends you to be. Tragically, there are some in this world whose time has come to an end. It doesn't mean that God doesn't love them or forgive them, and certainly God does. But for whatever reason, perhaps it is simply the grace of God, we have been given more time, time to grow, time to repent, time to reevaluate our lives, time to bear fruit for the sake of others. During this Lenten season, I invite you to reflect on how God is bearing fruit in your life. And I ask you to ask the simple question I began with, what would you do if you only had 24 hours or six months or one year left? How would things look different to you? Every sunset, every new day, you'd be so grateful, um, so filled with joy. So brothers and sisters, I encourage you to ask yourself that question and to not follow the example of Homer Simpson by spending your time watching bowling and eating pork rinds. I wish you all a very blessed week. Amen. Together with the whole church, let us confess our faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. 
He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Drawn close to the heart of God, we offer these prayers for the church, the world, and all who are in need. For the church around the world in all its forms. For pastors, deacons, bishops, chaplains, and mission developers. For church councils, committee chairs, and all lay ministry leaders. For congregations that contemplate difficult decisions about the future of their ministry. For our bishops, Liz and Jim. And for all the congregations of the Lower Susquehanna Synod. Merciful God. For the health of this planet and the well-being of its creatures, for lands impacted by droughts and at risk of wildfires, for fig trees and vineyards that produce fruit for our nourishment and enjoyment, for all farmers, gardeners, and agricultural workers as they prepare for spring weather, and especially, Lord, we thank you for the faithful volunteers who maintain our congregation's beautiful landscaping. Merciful God, for those called into positions of civic responsibility, for judges, attorneys, and court administrators tasked with uncovering truth and delivering justice, for activists and community leaders who cast a vision of a more compassionate and equitable society, uphold and guide the Perry County Commissioners Brenda Watson, Gary Eby, and Brian Allen, as well as all other local officials and civil, civil servants. Merciful God, for those who call upon you for mercy, for all who live in poverty and experience hunger, for any who feel tested beyond their strength, for those who are hospitalized or receiving extended treatment, and for all in need of healing, especially Marsha Williams, Sandy Spade, Grace Wolf, Jane Fry, Charles Ebling, Steph Kraus, Kathy Grabowski, and David Brocious. Merciful God, for our homebound members who are unable to be with us in worship today, that our Christian love and care will uplift their spirits and give them encouragement. We pray especially for Sid Whitmer, Marilyn Charles, Jesse Zink, Betty Hepfer, and Mert Holman. Merciful God, for all those who work to make our community stronger, all teachers, school bus drivers, social workers, EMTs, firefighters, police officers, nurses, doctors, and members of the armed forces. Strengthen them and guide the work of their hands. Send refreshment and peace to those who are weary in body, mind, or spirit. Merciful God. Jesus taught his followers to pray always and not lose heart. At this time, I invite the assembly to pray for any other people, concerns, or thanksgivings either by saying them out loud or in the silence of our hearts. Allie Lambert. Merciful God. O Lord of the nations, we pray for peace in this world for every place experiencing violence and warfare. We pray especially for the people of Ukraine, um, 
for all those who have lost loved ones, um, for those whose homes and places of work have been destroyed, and for those who are refugees. We pray, Lord, for all relief agencies and those who are working to bring the situation to an end. We pray that it may be sooner rather than later. Merciful God, O oh Lord, we commend into your hands all those whose earthly journeys have ended. With all the saints who now rest from their labors, we praise you for the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Comfort all who grieve, especially the family and friends of Alan Hall, Carrie Bell Auker, Glenn Kaufman, Harry Newlin, and Dave Ratliff. Merciful God, accept the prayers we bring, O God, on behalf of a world in need, for the sake of Jesus Christ. Amen. Sisters and brothers, the peace of the Lord be with you always. And let us share a holy wave of peace. <laughs> Getting closer. <laughs> and now, brothers and sisters, gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, we are bold to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. You are children of God, anointed with the oil of gladness and strengthened for the journey. Almighty God, merciful, majestic, and mighty, Bless you this day and always. Amen. Go in peace. Jesus meets you on the way.